We're going to start with performance reviews, and maybe some that suck, and maybe some that don't suck. Um, first, uh, just give you a little bit of background on me, and uh, this is also Andrew Tuttle, who was uh, a major partner in the work uh, that I did in this area. Um, so I'm currently the CEO at Lean Kanban uh, since August of last year. Uh, my path here has been through various uh, executive roles in Halliburton uh, at Landmark Graphics, which is a division of Halliburton, an oil and gas services company. Uh, this particular study that I'm going to show is work that began probably about 20 years ago when I, was, I kept getting frustrated with doing performance reviews and finding that I just wasn't getting uh, value to me or value to the employees in the, the reviews that I was doing. And so I started changing the game. I said, maybe I'm looking at the wrong problem. And I started looking at values-oriented view of performance. And it started to change for me. And actually, the, the feedback I got from managers that were working with me and, and employees that were working with me was, was always positive. And then when I came into IHS as a VP of product development uh, about uh, four years ago, it was a perfect time for me to come into a new role and also Oh, oh, this is a, okay. Um, this is also when I started to see that Andrew Tuttle had been there at the company for a while. He was doing something very similar. Now, Andrew didn't work for me. He was actually in a, in a parallel group uh, to the group that I was involved in. But he was going down a similar path in trying to uh, improve the performance reviews and also the performance appraisal or the, the overall process in HR. Uh, and both of us were, were managing development teams. So, um, this was good because he was doing something similar and I was able to work with him and actually build on what I've been doing for, for 20 years and this is the result that we'll be, be sharing is what we ended up doing. Uh, other things about me, I've been involved with the uh, Agile Alliance. Uh, I was the co-founder of the Agile Development Conference, which is now, I think we're the Agile Alliance's conference, which is 2,500 people a year. Uh, when we started, it was much smaller. We were about 250 people, but over time we grew it and I ran the conference for a number of years. I also was the uh, co-founder of the Agile Leadership Network, um, written the book, Stand Back and Deliver, about leading business agility. Um, and so now, now heading out doing network building uh, in the space, uh, Lean Kanban is front role. I've also, this is my fourth Agile India. I really enjoy coming here um, and have uh, enjoyed the area. Uh, Andrew has been uh, with IHS Market for 10 years, and it's been a great collaboration with him. So, a couple of questions from the audience first. So, who loves performance reviews? All right, we've got we've got a couple. So, what do you love about performance reviews? So, you appreciate the feedback and and building on that. So you, are you one giving giving the feedback, or are you the one uh, receiving it mostly? Both? Okay. And which side do you like better? <laughs> which side do you like better? <laughs> the giving feedback or the receiving? What's that? Okay, good. And we had another we had another person who really loves uh, performance reviews. Okay, and are you, uh, which side are you normally on? Are you on the, the giving of the feedback or the uh, receiving? Both sides, both sides, okay. So, so um, yeah, so I didn't know whether anyone was gonna, gonna raise their hand and say they love performance reviews. It, 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 there's a psychological safety thing here, right? Because if you raise your hand, you're like, this guy's just telling me performance reviews suck, so he's gonna, I'm sure he's gonna be, you know, pick on me and make fun of me, and that was my intent. But you guys gave some great answers, so I really appreciate that, because that's actually is, a real part of performance reviews is to try to figure out, you know, if in the agile community we value feedback, why why are we not getting real good feedback? How we design feedback into our performance and, and improve our overall performance? That's our intent. Um, so, what are some of the challenges that you have? So, so, those of you that didn't raise your hand and didn't like performance reviews, what are some of the challenges you've experienced with performance reviews? Oh, yeah. It's a sales pitch, yeah. So it's it's, got, it's, it's a bad. It's, it's not designed to actually uh, provide feedback. It's designed to. Uh, it's a winning game. 
Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. There's a recency effect. Yeah, yeah, and you probably were dealing with goals that were set when? A year ago. Yeah. So you, you <laughs> so something's incongruous here, right? We got we got a recency effect, yet we're setting goals from a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's one of the challenges in the, uh, having a conversation before the session with Biarte, because it's the same, I attended Biarte session yesterday about uh, beyond budgeting, and the problem with budgeting is we have three, three goals of budgeting that are kind of fighting with each other, and performance is the exact same problem. We've got multiple goals that performance reviews are trying to do, and in the end it comes down to things like this. It's about rewards. And if it is about rewards, how is that helping in terms of getting honest feedback? How is that helping in other areas? So, great, great conversation. Any other? Yeah. Right. Okay. So the feedback is is batched. It's big end, big end. And how do we feel about batches in the agile world? We don't like batches. We don't like big batches. We like small, continuous. Oh, great. great. Yeah. What's that? Oh, you need to differentiate people. Yeah, yeah. Somebody, somebody's decided you must differentiate. You know, you, you have to. How many people do stack ranking here? Is that stack ranking a fair number? It's become less and less popular, but uh, a lot of people who Microsoft is very, very big on stack ranking for a lot of times, and they they backed away from that. So. The human, it misses the human aspect, yeah. It's supposed to be about people and, and it misses the human aspect, yeah, totally. Yeah, no, great. Okay, um, anything that you seen that has worked well? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Anyone else? Other. other? Okay, yeah, velocity is a performance metric. Awesome. My, my, my stories are one million points. <laughs> awesome. Great. I'm worth a million. Huh? All right. Um, great. Let's move on to a bit of uh, what I've seen in terms of what got me going is that um, what I usually see is typical approach to objective setting and typical approach to, to performance reviews is this management by objective. You know, the organization sets some objectives, it bounces down to, and, and goes on down. We do the evaluation uh, reward. And, and HR has been preaching this for a long time. Uh, this is uh, MBO Peter Drucker, right? Uh, I think so. But anyway, this has been out since the 50s. And it really hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, it's sort of morphed into OKRs. It's more or less the same thing. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just generally not a big fan of this approach, it wasn't working for me. Uh, and this part of the thing was, oh, well, the problem is you're not making smart objectives. Smart objectives, you got to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based, or something like that. People using smart objectives? You are? Yeah? Okay. Not everyone, but okay. But this is a traditional approach. What I was finding in knowledge work and software development is there's some fundamental problems with smart objectives. Um, it's not always, but this is what I typically found. And this is some. This is actually from a, a HR book trying to show you what a good smart objective might look like. You know, increase code production rate, something lines of code per unit time in an actual HR book that people paid money for. Right? 
What sort of behavior does this drive? Is it what we want? Does it have anything to do with delivering happy customers? Delivering software to happy customers? No, this is crap. I mean, this is not at all a good thing. Uh, you know, smart objectives can have unintended consequences. You know, here we have, you know, our goal is to write bug-free software, so we're going to pay $10 per bug that we find and fix. What sort of behavior does that do? Right? All the development team goes, you who were rich. Why? Right? Because they're going to write themselves a new minivan. Right? You could write bugs really fast, and you can fix them real fast. You know, that's the wrong behavior. These are not the types of things we're trying to do. And when you start formulating things, and, and it's really easy to write bad smart objectives. Um, so we have this idea of smart objectives. Stuff. And I think it's one of the fundamental problems we have with most uh, traditional performance review systems. Uh, what I find, most smart objectives do not comprehend uncertainty. We talked about we set the objectives at the beginning, and then what happens, we review at the end, and we have a recency effect. So we don't, you know, and what do we have in software development, in any knowledge work? We have uncertainty. We know that. They have unintended consequences. I think they also lead to a myopic approach to career counseling, career coaching, which to me is one of the most important parts of feedback. And lastly, behind every objective is a subjective. Once you realize, I mean, we try, we go, oh, we gotta have objectives, we gotta have objectives. That is foolish. Every objective has a subjective. I mean, VRT's story on Beyond Budgeting is based on the same story. It's these unintended consequences, it's, it's these uncertainty. And when we set an objective, it was subjective in order to set that objective. So if you have a subjective in there anyway, why aren't we just acknowledging that from the get-go? Let's be real, let's be honest about this, and let's deal with it. So instead of smart objectives, what we end up are things which are pretty dumb. So this guy, W. Edward Stemming, very, very much uh, inspiring the modern movement of uh, change in systems thinking and management and lean, lean thinking. Uh, he said, abolish management by objective and annual performance. It's one of his 14 points. Great, let's just get rid of them. The problem with Stemming was he never really said what to do instead. And it sort of sucks. <laughs> because if I'm not going to do it, what am I do instead? Um, so I think he's right. I mean, the management of the objective part was a part of the problem. Uh, there are better ways to do it. And we've come across approaches that, that we like much, much better. Uh, I mean, so do they really have to suck? We think they don't have to suck. They can be pretty good. And actually, sometimes, I think we found that even if we didn't have to do them, we probably would, based on what we've ended up changing to. But we had to start with some guiding principles. We had to go back and think, what is it that we really care about? So in the conversations that I've had with Andrew, and we had a whole team that was involved in this, um, I made a comment, and Andrew, my partner, misunderstood what I said, but he took it and said, oh, what, we, we, what you said was values are what we value. And that's actually the same thing that Reed Hastings said, uh, said in his presentation to Netflix, but that's what he, but his confirmation bias was, I must have been talking about what Reed Hastings said. It wasn't exactly, I'll get to that later, is what I said. Um, but it's true. I mean, one of the things you have to understand is, are we a values-based organization? And if we value values, then let's understand what those values are. So, as we were a, a uh, development organization, we said, and this is basically the same thing that I had been working with, very close to the same thing I've been working with for 20 years, um, but Andrew had gone down an independent path, come up with something very similar, and then all I had to do was spend the last bit convincing him that I was right all along. And eventually he came along, so it worked out really well. Um, but we set up that these are the four, five things that we really care about in software development. Delivery, business engagement, teamwork, quality, and initiative and innovation. If these were the things we valued, then let's make sure that that's what we're looking at, and that's what we care about. And we went with some specific things, uh, you know, the short version and then a slightly longer version of those values. So that was the start point. These are the five things we're going to look at then let's figure out and structure around that. What I really said was that value is what we value, <laughs> okay? Which is, a, which is also really important. We value getting things delivered to our customers. And that once we, we, so he misunderstood what I said, but it was still really important, values. 
I think business value is what, I, what we, is important to us. And we came to this realization that what matters here, what, how do we define what, what value is? And we came up with this equation that says impact. Impact is the thing we really matter. What impact is our work having on our customers? And that impact is this combination of behaviors, skills, and opportunity. Okay? The behavior, skill, and opportunity come together, put that together, and the formula, fix it all together. The outcome of that is impact, and the real outcome of that impact is happy customer. So we then looked at this from two angles. One of the angles is, what's the leader's role in this? The other angle is, what's the employee's role in this? So the leader's role is to coach behaviors, to foster skill development, and to create opportunity. The employee's responsibility, you know, it's a part of a give and take here, the employee's responsibility in the equation is to evolve their behaviors based on the coaching, to develop their skills based on the opportunities that have been fostered, and based on the created opportunities, to seize those opportunities. This is what equation that really works in terms of career development. I think this was a really important aspect for us to, to grasp is what's this give and take and that, how does that change our coaching and mentoring role as leaders. The other thing we came to, to is the idea that with a promotion comes higher expectations. One of the things that, that I was always frustrated with doing performance reviews is all the people that were the high performers, it was always the, the really experienced people who said, oh, they're doing such great work. And I came to realize, but yeah, but don't we expect them to do great work every day? And so in building this into the system, that the expectations need to be reflected, the fact that the level and, you know, whatever level someone was at, that was an expectation setting that changed. So if we look at an example of this, we have three, three uh, technologists here. We have this young guy, Mark. We've got this you know, little bit older senior guy, Bill, and then you know, very senior, Steve. Each one of these, for the four, five core areas, we have a, the bar changes, right? We have expectations that are higher at each one of these levels. And finally, at the end, you know, at the, at the very, very senior people, um, we expect them to walk on water. And maybe St. Steve does walk on water. We don't know. It's, um, it's important that we, re, we I got this across, and it was one of the hardest things to get across to my managers is to setting that expectation high enough. We came to realize that we value career development over performance rating. We talked about the stack rankings, bell curves. A lot of HR departments want to have bell curves. They want to have six sports rankings. Sometimes you're forced to do it. We tried to decouple things as much as possible, so this was not the focus of what we did. What we cared about is career progression and the coaching and mentoring that goes along with making, uh, developing our employees. So what did we do? All right. So first of all, we had to go through the process of discovering the four responsibilities and also redefining our job. This is what, this is the, what our job descriptions looked like earlier. But one of the first things that Andrew did was, which he made sure that, you know, to try to clean these up a little bit. So when he looked at something like testing, I think it, the, it was really hard to follow, you know, what the expectation changed with over time. Now, Andrew is a bit of an architect, right? And software architect. And I know architects in India, it's really important to become I'm an architect and, and uh, the role of architect is really important here. I know that. I was managing a lot of teams here. Um, and it took me a while in my career to realize what, what was the core skill of architects. You know what I discovered? So this is a, this is a key thing you got to learn. What architects do is they're really good. Every time you look at the before picture, the lines cross. And when the architect comes in, a new picture, the lines don't cross anymore. That's a brilliant insight on what architects do. But no, this is, so that's what we did. We made our lines straight. Um, and it, was, it actually is some value to this because it helped us get some clarity as to, to what our job progression uh, looked like. But then we went back after really, so this is a very iterative process of really refining this, uh, taking a lot of what I have been doing for 20 years, building on top of it the things that, that Andrew had been working on, and building it out and, and then getting more people in our 
company involved in it. So it came down to these five core responsibilities, uh, sort of spreading, you know, really focusing on them and making sure we had really clear clarity around what we're expecting at each level of the organization. So example here, building quality and software from the ground up. And if we wanted, we came up with these things called key contributions to consider, the things that we're looking for. This provided us opportunity to describe some behaviors, some outcomes that we're looking for. Are we seeing clean code? Are we seeing unit tests, integration tests? Are we seeing active reduction in technical debt? These are the behaviors we're looking for. We can have this view from a review perspective of how this is happening, also coaching conversations about how we'd like to see more of it. We set expectations by level, working down from you know, associate level, we're expecting to be done with direction, down to you know, the executive software engineer, we're expecting them to be visionary. So we came up with descriptions of this, we came up with wording, you know, more than just, these were the, the, the short descriptions, but then we had longer descriptions for each of these. We also came up with this framework where we started looking at level setting and, and drawing this as a visual for, for an employee. We could have this and we could also look at a team this way. But then we'd have, um, okay. But this is the overall framework that we can look at is where are we at within, a, within the, uh, this. And we could put dots on this. I'll show you some examples of this a bit later. We also worked with HR. We brought in Abby Britt, who was, our, who was really engaged. She really heard about what we were doing. We tried to sell her on why this was really important and what we could use in terms of getting help from HR. And over the time that I've been doing approaches like this, I have done it with HR support. I've also done it under the radar of HR, where HR was not as supportive for me. Um, and so it's waffled back and forth over how much support I've had from HR. But um, it's much easier and much better when you have HR on your side. And uh, in this case, we were able to really enroll her, and she, she really um, got it. Uh, one of the things that helped uh, to start with, this is the heretic slide, uh, because uh, yeah, I am with like a lean Kanban company, and I'm showing a Scrum slide. So why the hell is that going on? Um, the reason is we were predominantly a Scrum organization at the time. Uh, we did have a fair amount of Kanban implementations. All the high performers were Kanban implementations, of course. But um, what, the, what worked about this, though, is that we were able to explore, explain to, to Abby, her HR representative, why are we worrying about setting these big goals at the beginning that we never make, I mean, we're, we're setting goals all the time. We have a pro process by which we're setting goals and controlling the system. So don't be afraid about this. What we really care about is developing people. The goals are gonna be set on a regular basis through the iterations uh, and the cycles, and we've got the feedback we've already in place. So this really helped sell her, and she was really supportive. Andrew was great. He wrote a, he wrote a manager's guide to this, um, which, we have made available to, to other companies that, that, that want this. Um, and this is great because there were some specific coaching activities that we set up, uh, some specific things that we cared about. And it was really a, a guidance to, to ma our managers. We also set up an employee's guide that was very short. You know, we didn't overdo this, but we just sort of just right, I think, in terms of uh, helping people. Also, here you see you had the comment earlier about frequency. Coaching to year out activity. We really em emphasize the importance of coaching and on one-on-ones and having, having these regular uh, interactions about where people stood. So if we look at the performance evaluation model I showed you earlier, then we had, we we're able to, to look at where are you at? Where is each employee at within the, evaluate, within the program? And what can we do about it? So some places we might be really excelling and doing great in delivery, but maybe we're not so great in innovation and, and uh, uh, initiative, right? So this was sort of, this becomes the coaching canvas. Through the dots and through where we're at relative to the expectations, we can have the conversations about, okay, you want to be promoted. To be promoted, you should be performing at this level. Okay, that's a conversation we can have. It's a great conversation. You can have that. And the feedback is helping both the, the employer, the, the manager, who's saying, in order to help develop you and get you to a higher performance level, these are the things I'd like to see. And then as the employee, you're getting that direct feedback that these are what I'm expecting. So we're, we're having that regular conversation. And it's really helping, you know, the, the mentoring and coaching is the important part. So if this is our level of expectation, you can see we have a few that are uh, performing above that level of expectation, a few things we want to try to really work on. And that's where we focus, you know, the coaching on building up and bringing up the, the overall 
uh, performance level. So I'm going to go through an example here, uh, John the Journeyman, uh, where we looked at it, and, and uh, sometimes we do this as an exercise, but due to time, I'm just going to go through it uh, directly here. So this is a case of John the Journeyman, someone maybe you know, in the 40s or 50s has been working for a long time, they're doing good work, they've been promoted, they're really sort of performing at the level of expectation of that job. Um, but then maybe they're not as doing so well in innovation and initiative. Maybe they haven't kept up their skill set. Now, is this an issue or not? Right? This is a coaching conversation. Maybe they're happy in that role. They're happy not, not improving. You know, they're, they're sort of at, at the end of their career, and it's not a big issue. It's, it's what they, they want. Okay, is that what the employer, is that what the, the, the manager wants? They're comfortable with that? We have an agreement. We have to work out. Is this right or, or, or not? On the other hand, if, if John is thinking he's ready for a promotion, he's got some work to do. And so this is the conversations that we can have. Uh, and this framework for the conversation really, really has, has uh, shifted the game from, from what had been performance evaluation to more uh, performance mentoring. So. so let's look at how, how did things go with this rollout. So first of all, how did the managers like it? Um, pretty overwhelming, 100% said that they supported it over what we've been doing before. Um, and it's not that what we were doing before was so bad. It, I mean, it's just sort of the same thing most people have been doing with trying to, to do smart objectives. It just wasn't working that well. This changed the game for the managers. The managers loved it because it, it was, not only was it much simpler because everyone had really identified the roles and responsibilities that we were expecting of them, um, it was simpler, but it was also having much richer conversations. So managers loved it. Um, question is how well it had been improving career conversations, because that's what we're really trying to emphasize. Again, very high support from, from our management, uh, from the managers. And um, this is the manager perception of how well their employees were liking it. Um, again, very high. So this is one side. This is the manager perception, which is great. Uh, we also needed to figure out, well, if we're asking managers how they think their employees like it, we better ask the colleagues and the employees what they really thought about it as well. And uh, colleague feedback, also very positive. So 73% supported it, uh, either somewhat better or much better. Only a few who have thought it was uh, much worse. So uh, generally feeling pretty good about it compared to what we've been doing. Um, this was something for us to look at from an improvement. The managers thought they were doing a great job at improving career conversations. And it was better, 57%, but this is one we wanted to try to grow and improve, make this, uh, bring some of the, the neutrals over into the more somewhat helpful and very helpful and with regards to career development, very important part. And, uh, and I think this was, was also quite positive, is that employees knew what was expected of them in order to get their promotions. So that was a big, big improvement. So then we look at the overall program after we rolled it out for a year. Um, we inspected and adapted, and part of this inspecting and adapting happened really before we even rolled it out, because we were irrevocably we developing it. Uh, so come with a couple of things we had, challenges integrating with the HR system. Uh, the, HR, the HR approach to performance reviews was emphasizing performance over career growth, so we had to sort of fit it in into the radar, and that's where having HR support was really good, um, because we were able to emphasize the importance of the career growth and the performance management piece of it uh, was, was uh, de-emphasized, so we tried to fit it easy. But the tool itself and the, the mindset in HR was something we had to work with. Um, the HR tool was not particularly good. I don't know of any good HR tools, but one of the big problems was, is that uh, we wanted to have a very fine-grained ability of like, you know, decimal numbers, a 3.1 or a 3.2. We wanted it on a scale where it was at, whereas the HR system was was integers of one, two, three, four, five, uh, fourth bit. So that was a, a bit, we ended up having to do some reverse engineering in order to get, get the, uh, the numbers to work out, which was a bit more trouble than, than I would have liked to have. But these are the challenges you face in trying to fit into existing systems. But there are almost always a workaround to it. So yeah, the system you know, does have the ability to, you, you can't, it, as long as you have the intent of what you're trying to get out of it, that's the important part. And then you, you work back under, uh, into the system and figure out how to make it you know, get done. Uh, there was a lot of redundancies in paperwork, because of, uh, partially because of the HR system, and so, uh, yeah, but again, we dealt with it. We, pre we preferred having the redundant paperwork to get the, the work done because the result was so much better. 
And we discovered there were two possible companies, and that was one of the things that, by doing the exercise, we, we kind of, part of the, the other thing we discovered is once we rolled this out um, in our organization in software development, we found a number of other organizations saying, well, what are you doing? Because they were all struggling with the same problem. So they came to us for, for advice on how to implement it within uh, non-software development tools. So that was uh, another good thing. We refined the structure a little bit in order to add both uh, behavior and impact. Initially, we just had behaviors, but we needed to have both both sides of the equation on behavior and impact. Um, and then we also went beyond software developers. Initially, it was just for software developers. Uh, we extended it to all the roles within the development team. We also we also went and extended it to managers. And when I had done this in the previous 20 years, um, I had used the same approach to talk sort of all knowledge workers, including uh, leaders. Um, and had found it fairly robust in dealing with that because it was the same type of thing. So those five, same five areas really apply pretty well across, across the board. What we did find though is as we dealt, dug deeper into it with leadership roles was that the leadership roles were a little different and so we did end up coming up with a, with a slightly different approach on, on leadership to emphasize a little bit different core values. So, um, you know, the, we use the sort of the same basic ideas but then extended it to, to, uh, Leadership role, high quality software for both, both sides of the equation. So it's a little bit different extent, but the same core value. What are we doing in terms of driving quality? So, do performance reviews have to suck? Um, I don't think so. I think you can actually have very good, we value feedback and we value performance management, performance mentoring and coaching. That can be done. And you can build, the important part is to build a structure and build an environment where people feel that feedback is valuable and helping the, the employer, helping the employer to build intellectual capacity by, by helping develop careers and honoring the feedback and helping the employee know what's expected of them uh, from a performance, uh, a career development perspective. And the whole HR system uh, was sort of came in from the market side, the other, the other side of the organization, MERS, but this has survived. So it's proven to be robust and, and uh, provided value uh, on both sides, both managers and, and employees uh, really have found value in the system. So with that, uh, just my contact information, slides will be available. Um, again, Andrew's contact information will be on that as well. Uh, and then since I'm now with uh, Lean Canada, just I'm, I'm available the rest of the week to talk about, if you want to talk about performance reviews, if you'd like to talk about what we're doing, some of the new exciting things we have going on in the world of Kanban, uh, love to talk to you. So, with that, any questions? Anything you'd like to? Yeah, look. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, you, so a lot of that is, is a cultural thing. So you have to build that that's that the culture values that feedback and values that development. Um, the IHS culture was one of very, very much one of engaging employees. We ran a customer engagement, a colleague engagement survey, and so it's something that was really sort of ingrained in the culture. So that was a big part of it. Uh, I think a lot of it also came from support from the top. So I was running my group, and, and I was I wasn't sure coming in how receptive my management team would be to it. Um, and so I just threw it out on the table and said, oh, they loved it because they just had been struggling so much with a system that wasn't working. And so they just said, oh, great, this, this solves my problem because I, I haven't known how to do it. And you're giving me a bit of a recipe, even though it's a wide open recipe, you gave me a recipe for how to do this. So I think the, the key is getting that buy-in and the support and, and having that environment that, that really respects that relationship and the value that we're trying to do with this to build that. So part of that was me coming in to tell my manager, I value this. Right? I value this feedback and we really care about mentoring and developing our, our employees. And we had that also throughout the rest of the organization. The rest of the organization had a similar enough viewpoint to that. If you come in and try to do this in an environment that doesn't have that, you could easily end up with what you're saying, which is you come up with a system and it fails because you don't have you don't have the, the buy-in that this is anything but a checkbox on the side. So, again. Yeah. 
we, we did this for about 600 people. So, so it was, and, and it's, uh, I think subsequently they've taken a little bit long, a little bit larger than that. And there was the interest in taking it even further than that. But yeah, it, it wasn't at that level of scale, right? And, and so the thing is, what, and, and this is where also having HR's buy-in helps us a lot too, because a lot of times what happens, but before I was doing it on a very much smaller scale, you know, 50 to 100 people, um, and it went a little bit longer when it was larger when I had a short period of time because I had really good support from HR, but then HR shifted out and they referred back into the old way, and so I just sort of went under the radar, continued to do my thing, um, and uh, it worked, but I didn't have the impact that I had until I really had a broader support. And, and part of it also, I, I started enrolling other managers, the apparel managers and, and, and peers that were getting them engaged. And so once I had a, we had a team of people doing a similar thing, I had a lot more uh, action. There. So you sort of build it out and, and, and start. Like I said, you, you can do this without HR support too, locally and, and uh, get some of the value. It's much better to have you know, the broader exposure. We, in each case, we still had to come up with ratings. So we had to, we basically backfired to get ratings. So we, and, and that was part of the problem, is, is one of the side effects, I said, that the HR system still viewed it as a rating, even though our emphasis was on performance development. Um, and so this is one of those bundling problems that, that we couldn't get around, so we tried to do the best we could within the system that we had. And part of that was also, I left, we were trying to see if we could, could enroll HR in helping get over that hurdle, uh, and I left before that battle was fought, and, and, and on the same time that that you know, changed because the new HR role came in from the new organization. Um, so I don't know how that went. I haven't, I haven't had a chance to follow up with Andrew on it. But uh, yeah, so what we did, even though we had to do it, because we had this in, in, imposed bundling that had to happen, so we ended up coming up with performance rating out of the system, and it worked adequately. I would have preferred to, to change that and decouple them a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there can be a stack ranking, and, and in our case, it was sort of stack ranking, but not quite a stack ranking. But yeah, there was, there was a distribution that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially here. Especially here. <laughs> I noticed this is people have, when I was managing teams in India, we always said, well, you can't share this with anyone. Well, that didn't matter. You're still going to share. And so it happens. <laughs> Everyone knows that. Um, yeah, and so the thing is, you want to be, you want to, we, we always use the, what we call the bulletin board test. Which is, if we put, if we, you know, we have this idea that you're not supposed to share anything, but if we did get it out, if everyone went out on the bulletin board and everyone saw everything, we had radical transparency, would it be a problem? And so that was the, the guidance, guidance that I gave to my managers, is we're going to do this as best we can, to this, and that, that uh, if this was radically transparent, where the reviews were, where everything else, we wouldn't feel bad about it. Um, so the couple of things that come from this approach, is one is instead of this idea that I have a rating and that rating relates to some, some bonus or some, some salary increase, what comes out of this is where is somebody at in their journey from the level they're at to the next level. And we have decent benchmark information about what pay should be at a given level. So the thing is what we've done is tied this much more closely to our um, performance of, to our um, promotion Perspective. Where are you at in your, your journey to promotion? And that gives us a much better story to have with the, with regards to where they're at, because we're getting some compared to benchmarking for that same level. So this is, this just helps us in, in sort of, um, scaling our, our, uh, uh, rewards to what, what the market is saying. So it's a little bit, it's trying again to tie it to what matters, not to some arbitrary, well, I think this person's doing wonderful stuff, they're, they're a superstar. Well, what really are they? Where, where are they at in the journey? What is it relative? Where should they be relative to the scales that we have some pretty good information on?
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned something really good, which is this is an ongoing conversation. There should not be surprises at the end, right? And, and that's what we, you know, when you just get in this big batch mode of having these conversations once a year, people are surprised, which is why, you know, they're, they're, they're fearful of what's going to come up and they just you know, know that and they don't really know what to do. So, you're having regular conversations and, and having a, and, and the other thing that this is, by having this, you have a framework for a conversation on an ongoing basis. And you're like, well, what about this area? What about that area? Um, whereas, and, and I, think, I think what what we find otherwise, when we, without this, a lot of our one on the one on one conversations are much more tactical. They are much more about what happened with the why your project go down last week. Right? But and, and and that's important. Those conversations are important. But if you're really looking for career guidance, that's an ongoing, much more strategic you know, conversation. And this framework at least gives you a means to have that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. No. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so you probably can't eliminate it. It's always going to be there. Um, this is, if you get back to that slide I said about opportunities, this is about the leader creating opportunities so that, that we're, and, and the problem we face is that oftentimes the person who's, you know, we, we high grade, we say the palace is so wonderful, I want them to build the next palace and the next palace and the next palace and the um, brick, you know, mentions building the house doesn't get that opportunity. So part of this is about cultivating those opportunities, recognizing it. So I think it's a great point to bring up. There will always be these biases, and that's the role of leaders, I think, is to try to really understand how much value is being done, that it's, it's, it's to some extent just as important that we have a lot of houses out there that as we have a palace. That the palace is what looks so beautiful and gets all the praise. So, so we have to hold it. That's a, that's a leadership role to, to help that. So, so yeah, so you have team activities. It's one of the, the it's one of the main reasons we include teamwork as a key element of it. What are you doing? So ultimately, what I'm asking the question you know, that is, what are you doing to make your team better? Okay. And so you could actually ask that for every single one of those things. What are you doing to make your team better at delivery? So you have an individual role in making your team better at delivery. You have an individual role in making your team better at connecting to the business. You have an individual role in making your team a better team. So we, I, I, I've never found that hard the looking at a team, respecting the power of the team and the importance of the team, yet still identifying the individual contributions that, that each person was making to making that team better. And, and the other thing you can do is you can also engage the team in that same conversation. They know too. So it's, it, so it, 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 the, um, yeah, it, there are great ways to get feedback across the board. Um, 
usually this, I, I, I found that that part wasn't the hard part. Um, the hard part was just helping people understand what was expected of them and, and how could they how could they take ownership of their career and what's their responsibility for that and then give them the guidance to, to take that on so that you, you create that mentoring relationship as a leader. Anything else? Any, any like to talk about? 